to my intros first and then we'll hope that Bettina gets on by then. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment or the ERA as we conventionally know it has been a movement to ensure equal rights for women under the Constitution since the first Women's Rights Convention in 1848. Over the past 172 years there's been a constant struggle to instill the words that would make women and men equal in the U.S. Constitution. From state to state struggle to get the required passage through the imposition of deadlines to the final ratification in the VA Assembly in January of 2020, there's been a fierce tug of war between those who clearly see the need to raise the legal standard of women to that of men versus the people who believe it's already covered under our constitutional areas or actually diminishes the rights of women. Regardless, enshrining what would seem like a very logical piece of civil rights in the Constitution is a struggle that we're going to hear about today. Some wonderful speakers, director of the RA Coalition and Fund for Women's Equality. Bettina has conducted focused lobby trainings on the issue of constitutional equality, and she oversaw the creation of a widely used ERA advocacy packet with information on how to contact elected officials, reach out to media, and encourage constituency outreach. Bettina previously worked as the program's director and interim di executive director at the National Women's Political Caucus. We've invited Kim Cummings and Anna Bradley, leading members of the VA chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, to speak about the Delta's critical support role in the passage in Virginia. The Deltas are an organization of college-educated women committed to constructive development of its members and to public service with a primary focus on the Black community. An integral part of the earlier passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave all women the right to vote, they have also thrown their influence and energy in that same characteristic fashion to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Kim Cummings is a retired educator of 36 years. She's a member of the Fredericksburg Area Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, the Virginia Social Action Task Force of Delta Sigma, the Stanford NAACP, the National Council of Negro Women, and the Senior Vice Chair of the Stafford Committee. Kim's passion for social justice is evident. It covers a wide range as unapologetic. Her mission and resolve is simple, to see her community empowered 
and to use its voice to speak truth to power. Our final speaker will be Ellie Schmiel. She's one of the major leaders of the modern day American feminist movement. Ellie is the president and co-founder of the Feminist Majority and the Feminist Majority Foundation, founded in, founded in 1987, and has served as president of the National Organization for Women for three terms, in addition to her work as an activist, a grassroots organizer, a lobbyist, and a political analyst. So without further ado, I'm going to ask if we can start with Bettina. Are you here? There she is. I'm here. Okay, great. It's so good to see you. It's good to see you too. You have a very chippy background. I'm very much enjoying it. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you about it, how to do it later. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. So good to see everyone oh. on this phone. Um, I want to thank you. I want to just say how amazing it's been because I know that um, this is a new way of communicating and advocacy. And I think that um, everyone is continuing to show up. And I know that for everyone, this is time trying to figure out how to move forward. But I've just seen from the ERA community such a strong desire and um, strength in their dedication to moving the ERA forward, which has just been so wonderful. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ERA. I don't know quite how much background I need to provide you all because I see so many people who have so much experience on this phone. Um, so please raise your hand if you want me to go through the history of Alice Paul, um, or, or, or if I should go through Alice Paul. Okay, Connie wants to go through Alice Paul. Great. So um, the history of the ERA is basically a 100-year history. And as we approach the suffrage history, the centennial suffrage, which is this year, um, we... Um, we kind of know that our work isn't done and that the vote was the first the first part of what alice paul originally and i think probably until her her death saw as a two-part process the era being the second part so the era was introduced in 1923 just three years after suffrage was um, ratified to the u.s constitution and you know to give some perspective that also took a really long time but at this time and you know at this time and era um we believe and feel that it is past due to see alice paul's work finished and past past time to see women's equality which is in some 82 percent of the world's constitutions ratified in the u.s constitution so through the history through that um it it took quite a few decades for the ERA to pass through Congress. It passed through Congress in 1972. And when it passed through Congress in 1972, there was a seven year deadline in the preamble, which is really important as we talk about moving forward, the fact that this, this deadline was put in the preamble rather than the text of the amendment itself. Um, just because by doing that, when it was sent to the states, which is what happened after it was passed through Congress, the states never voted to ratify that seven-year deadline. So after um, it was ratified, after it was voted out through Congress, states kind of ratified in a rush. And, um, and it looked sort of as if, you know, this was a done deal. But throughout the 70s, there was backlash to, um, to so much progress that had been made both you know, through the women's movement um, from the 1960s, and although not completely accurate, um, if people have been watching the Mrs. America series, um, you know, that's what they're trying to show on it. And so by the time that that seven-year deadline was about to expire, it was apparent that there, that wasn't enough time. And 35 of the 38 required states had ratified. Um, so in Congress, led by Congressman uh, Elizabeth Holtzman, with led in the advocacy community, I don't see Ellie yet, but um, Ellie was incredibly important in seeing that um, deadline bill passed, the, the extension bill passed. Um, they were able to pass a bill to extend the deadline by some three years. She would give you the exact months and dates, six months and like four days, you know, some un unusual number 
of time, um, which some argue just wasn't in itself enough time to change the legislatures in order for the remaining three states to ratify. So in 1982, that deadline did expire. Um, but the movement to ratify the ERA never expired. And so every single um, congressional session since 1982, there has been an ERA introduced in some form or another. Um, and so kind of what I like to point out to people is, I think one of the things that we um, should really talk about is that since 1923, because obviously you couldn't introduce the ERA, or I mean, I guess maybe you could, but it would make no sense to introduce the ERA when it was being considered by the states. But since 1923, every single congressional session has had an ERA introduced. So there never was a pause in this movement and there never was a time where women weren't working to see this. So, um, you know, when people say there wasn't support, that's not true. There was never a time that it wasn't introduced. And throughout the, since 1982, there have continued to be a lot of women and some who I see on the screen who never gave up the fight and who continued the movement in the states to ratify because they felt that it doesn't matter if that deadline passed, it shouldn't be there, and we're gonna still ratify this amendment um, for many reasons. If Even if people don't count it, it matters to, to us. So um, additionally, around uh, 1995, 1992, the Madison Amendment, uh, which is the most recent amendment, it's the 27th Amendment, was ratified. And the Madison Amendment for history um, was originally introduced when the Constitution was being ratified in 1787. Um, and it was originally introduced as potentially a part of the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments, but for some reason or another just didn't get in there. And um, so 200 and, you know, however many years later, um, 200 and something years later, um, a student found this pending amendment and said, um, the history of it's actually interesting. He said, I'm going to make this my, my project for my school project. I'm going to see this amendment passed. And he did. And so, um, so congressional pay raises are not allowed to happen during a congressional session, so that's a good thing. But what that kind of showed was this idea of meeting a time limit to make an amendment you know, sufficiently contemporaneous, which is what they argue, is that they need the time limit to make sure that there's not too much time so society hasn't decided, okay, we're not interested in that anymore. Um, you know, what does that mean if you can amend you know, one constitutional amendment 200 years later, and yet 40 years later, we're not able to continue to consider the Equal Rights Amendment, which is a much, you know, more, it's a much more needed, you know, strong principle for this country to recognize women's equal citizenship rights than, I mean, I guess maybe some people would say con congressional raises, but I would say that um, recognizing women's equal citizenship rights is, you know, much more important than even that and should never have probably had that deadline or time limit um, and should be moved forward. So um, in the late 90s, there became kind of a movement to remove the time limit from the ERA. And that has really um, took off, I would say, in the early 2010s. I know Holly Joseph is here and Holly and some, um, some of her colleagues were really instrumental in making sure that this most recent version of the deadline removal bill was introduced and led by Senator Cardin. Um, so in the Senate, it's led by Senator Cardin, Holly's from Maryland. So that was really um, great constituent work. So that bill has um, that kind of, I think, so that, that effort has gained a lot of momentum. After the 2016 election, I think that especially um, raised the awareness within the general public that we hadn't quite gotten where people maybe thought we had. Um, and in terms of women's equality, and we saw the resurgence of you know, the Women's March and, and all of that. And with that, um, in 2017, after the 2016 election, Nevada 
voted to ratify, becoming the first state to vote to ratify in 45 years. In 2018, Illinois followed. And then in 2020, most recently, um, and Anna was instrumental to that, um, Virginia voted to ratify becoming the 38th required state, which is what the constitutional, the, what the constitution requires un, under Article 5. The constitution does not mention time limits, does not mention rescissions, um, but it does mention state ratifications and what it mentions is that you need three quarters of the states and we've done that. So, um, so right now, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment has technically satisfied the Article 5 requirements for being part of the Constitution. However, we know it's not there yet. Um, and I don't know if that's kind of where you want me to stop, uh, because I know Ellie's going to talk about that. But where I work at, I'll just give some background on the ERA Coalition. So I'm the DC Director and the Director of Outreach and Advocacy for the ERA Coalition. We were founded in 2015. Um, which was kind of the perfect time to be founded <laughs> because of um, this resurgence and the amazing work being done in the states and, and federally. Um, and we uh, were founded to kind of bring together a national constituency for the Equal Rights Amendment to pass to, to have that very single one issue focus. Because what we found was that there were lots of people who cared about the ERA, but if you looked at it at the national level, it wasn't moving through there. I mean, it was being introduced, but it wasn't necessarily being moved through the federal legislature. So a lot of groups at the national level are working on many issues and, it, and it's hard to justify spending a ton of time on something that doesn't seem to be moving forward, which is one thing I, I forgot to mention is that bill to remove the deadline did pass this past February in the House of Representatives. It was very exciting. It was a bipartisan passage and it's currently stalled in the Senate. However, they have 49 senators who are co-sponsors, again, bipartisan. So we're working really hard to get that passed through the Senate. And if we can't get it passed with the uh, current senators, we will find a way to get new ones. But the ERA coalition came together to kind of build all of this, to, to glue the support that already existed and glue the work that was already being done. Another thing I always like to make sure to point out is that um, Nevada, Illinois, Virginia's ratifications didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't necessarily like President Trump came into office and the ERA was ratified. You know, there were women who've been working on this in those states for decades, and there were efforts that I know underway every single Congress, every single state legislature session by the women who had been setting up the um, setting it up so that when there was the right right political moment, right societal moment, um, that they were there to see that it could be through. They had lined up the advocates, they had lined up um, the legislators. All they really needed was the right legislative makeup to see it get done. Um, and, and so that's a really important thing for us to remember is that you know nothing happens in a vacuum and we have the work of decades of work with these state activists to think for the fact that we are at state number 38. So that's kind of where we're at now. I know Ellie's gonna do the, where we're going next, um, but the ERA coalition is here to kind of be a well, to be, um, to be a place where people can come and they can get to know each other. We have bi-weekly calls where we have representatives from activists from North Carolina and Virginia, Georgia, Oklahoma, Alabama, uh, Utah, Arizona, who come on to support each other um, and to share advocacy skills and share what they're doing. Um, and I know a lot of our state activists from around the country were so excited to be part of the Virginia movement. And now that Virginia is ratified, Virginia is excited to be parts of theirs. So it's really important to have that, that community and that's what we're trying to build at the coalition. And I'd be glad to answer any questions after. Thank you so much. We're going to take all questions afterwards. Um, so uh, I'm going to now turn to Kim Cummings and Anna. Kim Brooke. and I are delighted. <laughs> all right, ladies, tell me everything you know about Delta Sigma Theta. And <laughs> Anna, I'm going to leave it to you to go first. OK. Soon, uh, Bettina, it's good to see you again. 
Um, I am the social action chair for the Petersburg alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And we, our service area covers uh, six counties and cities in Southside, Virginia. Our sorority was founded in 1913 at Howard University. And our first uh, public act was to participate in the 1913 Women's Suffrage March. And we were encouraged to do so by Mary Church Terrell, who is an African-American woman, um, rather prominent. And she herself was very active in the suffrage movement. At the time, she was 50 years old. She had a longstanding uh, uh, relationship with several of the other uh, suffragists of the day. And they did everything they could to dissuade us from marching in the parade. Uh, again, they were trying to appeal to Southern uh, sympathies there. And so, but we were determined. And so we were 22 women out of, I think, at most 40 Black participants in the parade of about 15,000 people. So Delta today is comprised of almost a thousand chapters, primarily in the United States. We do have chapters in Canada, in Asia, uh, and in Europe and the Caribbean. So uh, our founding goes back to 1913. And how we got called to this work in Virginia, State Senator Rosalind Dance, who's no longer serving in the State Senate, uh, asked Deltas to come to the Capitol on Women's Equality Day, which is August 26, 2018. Uh, and I wasn't able to be there, but I'm not certain why she asked people to come, but approximately 50 or 60 Deltas from around the Commonwealth showed up because uh, Rosalind Dance, who is a member of Delta Sigma Theta, asked us to to appear, and it was at that point that most of us were rather surprised to find out that the ERA had uh, had never been ratified. We had just pretty much assumed that, given the the gains that women had made in life, that that had happened. And so Rosalind asked us to come, knowing our history of being involved in in this work for women's equality, going back to our tutor, Mary Church Carroll. So Kim, do you have anything you'd like to add to how we came to be involved? Um, no, I know that for me, um, it was Katie Hornick um, had contacted um, me, or I don't even know how I met Katie. I don't know, somehow, I don't know. I don't even know how <laughs> we, we met, but, um, we just, I guess, do this process of um, the campaign of, you know, getting this done. And um, I became one of the people, in a hub person for the Fredericksburg area because the chapter that I am a part of represents Fredericksburg City, um, Stafford, Spotsylvania County, King George and Caroline County. Those are the areas that our chapter service and they were looking for someone in this area to help with handing out like the t-shirts or the buttons or the flyers or some of the promotional material and so i you know made myself available for that um also when they when it was necessary to do events um when, especially when you were doing the screening of the i enjoyed angels um we, you know, Katie called and we said, okay, let's, let's prepare something. We did about three different events um, around the movie and we um, actually collaborated once with uh, one of the social act social socially active churches in the area. And then we did one with the college, Mary Washington. And then we um, also collaborated with, even with the Stafford Democratic Committee just to, um, to showcase the campaign. Um, we, we assisted with uh, the tour, when they were doing the bus tour, um, going around the, the Commonwealth to, um, with, you had the legislators going around the Commonwealth with a lot of the VA, ERA people now. Um, we assisted with making Fredericksburg one of the stops. So um, I think that we just, 
knew the the goal and knew that historically that Delta had participated. And again, looking at what our mission is, is to make sure that every voice is counted, right? And so that was just another opportunity for us to make sure that we educated our community on what the ERA was, because we met a lot of people who weren't um, knowledgeable. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know that it wasn't part of the constitution. So this was another opportunity for us, again, to educate um, our community and Delta is a nonpartisan organization. So if there, so it doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's an, if it's a cause that aligns with our mission, we're going to work it right. So, um, we just went out into the community. We invited legislators of both sides of the aisle. We talked to our community to make sure that everyone, um, was knowledgeable of it and we just did events ongoing and then there were other events happening we just made sure that we promoted it as well and try to get um, as many people to come out to support us also so yeah we just had our, our hands in that so that was it's been um it's been exciting <laughs> what what yeah. i do want to uh, uh go back to is the intentionality of people like eileen davis and Katie Hornig and brought mm -hmm. in their traditional coalition to become more diverse and inclusive. Uh, because even today, as Katie was educating several people who had longstanding uh, work in terms of uh, trying to get the ERA ratified, few of them knew of the diversity of voices that had existed that African American women had a long standing history of over a hundred years of advocating for equality, women's rights, uh, for the right to vote, our role in the suffrage movement here. And I think that that is very critical of, of broadening the perspective. And even today, we have several older people who perhaps. I uh, remember trying to engage in a broader community of people and they were were not uh, giving a very welcoming, uh, they were not welcome into that movement. So uh, you have to understand that for us, our commitment to our sorority is a lifetime commitment. So it's not just while we're collegiate. So we have a lifetime commitment to public service. But I do want to stress the intentionality of people who were leading the Virginia Equality Movement, the VA Ratify ERA Movement. I uh, give a big shout out to Eileen Davis and Katie Hornug for being, for, for being intentionally uh, seeking to be diverse and inclusive, to include all voices. Yeah, because that, that, that really is important. Um, Ann and I was talking about that actually this morning, that even though historically our goal has been to fight for equal rights for all people, part of the suffrage movement at that time was exclusive because they, because um, even though women did receive their right to vote, black women still didn't have the right to vote. And so we were still fighting for that cause regardless, but there was, I mean, you have to, we have to embrace and understand and acknowledge it and remember that there was a, fra a faction of the movement that said, we have to exclude them in this because it's going to defeat our cause, right? So we have to understand that we were, black women were put to the side during this process because people were fearful. If we, you know, if we add black women into this, we're not going to get it done. So the fact that, like Anna said, that the VR, um, VRA Virginia um, campaign was intentional in making sure that black women were, um, had a voice in the forefront of the campaign. So we appreciate that because we've always fought for it. And so to make sure that when we talk about women that we are inclusive um, at all times. So just want to make sure that we make that statement. Okay. You're on you're on mute. Kyle. I'm on mute. I know. <laughs> I know you're on mute. Those are the three words now that are going to four words. 
found in our vocabulary. Okay. Thank you so much. There's no better example from you two ladies about us. We are all in together. Yes. Okay. So that's the really important stress there. So thank you so much. Now we're going to move on to Eleanor Schneel. Ellie is with us on phone, uh, but not visible because her camera works not today. So I am so glad just to hear from Ellie as it is. Let's um, let me get let me get her unmuted. I have to slip. Right. There she is. She's unmuted, right? right? Yes, you're. I'm here. Yep. Oh, great! Thank you so much, Ellie, and I will tell you to take it over. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for that history on the deltas. It was great, and for Bettina who summed it all up. So um, the the. Uh, so I think I'll just move to a couple, just make a couple comments. I think the, the great thing is how big our coalition is. It's, it's fantastically large. And in 1982, though, it was also fantastically large. We had, I looked it up, we had 485 groups and um, it, representing every segment of society and almost every woman's organization. Um, and, and basically, we were very high in the polls. And the only reason I'm saying that is a lot, I just like to keep on refuting, this was not a fight among women, it was a power fight. And the power fight essentially is those people who profit from discrimination want to keep it that way. And for women's discrimination, they, they profit really big in the insurance industry, and I can go into exactly how, and they do on, on the whole issue. We call it equal pay, but just remember, by paying women less, a lot of people like a lot more money. And some industries hire principally women, and, and that's one of our problems. I could go into other problems, but I, on the positive side, we were, it was a big movement, and it never stopped. Yes, we hit another so-called timeline of, that we in uh, in 1982, but the movement kept going. That's the important thing. And right now, it is as strong as it's ever been. We are now in the eight high 80 percentiles, and in some polls, as high as 94 percent of the public. Uh, and we have even more support. So what's the problem? The problem again is essentially the power is. Um, in, in the Chamber of Commerce and in, in, um, in so many different areas and all those uh, powerful are still there and they control and this now I'm going to go into partisan politics because we must. Uh, why did it change in Nevada, Illinois and in Virginia? Because the power alignment changed in the elections. In 2016, the Democrats captured the con in Nevada, the governorship in both houses. And, and different, the difference between uh, then and when we, when Nevada's always been a targeted state, was not only did we capture the leadership, we had a huge number of women who were feminists on the floor. And that made a very big difference too. With very strong leadership on the floor, for example, some of you have uh, met uh, Pat uh, Spearman, uh, it made all the difference in the world. But without that being in the majority, it wouldn't have been possible. By the way, Nevada now is the first state in the union that now has a majority woman in the state legislature. Yep. In, in Illinois, it was another power struggle. And I, it takes a little longer, but I can tell you that, um, when, when, what, what we had was a moderate Republican in the governorship, we had that before, but this one was determined to pass the ERA, as was the Democratic leadership. That was very unusual, and they, as you know, passed it in 2018. And in, 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 in Virginia, we never had a vote on the floor of the House That's since right. 72. And why did it change? Because that movement in Virginia was so strong and it was electoral. And we worked very hard in the 2019 election and flipped the House and the Senate. Now the leadership was not going to block it in committee. They had blocked it in committee in the House from 72 to 220. And it fell through. And with historic changes, I mean, just think, a speaker, a, woman, a feminist woman speaker, the majority leader of 
um, Charnel Herring, an African-American woman, first woman, a speaker in the 400 and some years of the uh, assembly in, uh, uh, in the delegates in Virginia, the first African-American majority leader, the Deltas were there, the whole coalition was there. It was very exciting. Now what's up? Now is another political movement. We must, we must flip the Senate. If we flip the Senate and keep the House, I guarantee you both houses will remove the deadline. And if we win a new pre uh, um, president, that new president will instruct the Department of Justice not to block the archivist from signing it. Yes. And it will be signed. I, 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 when I say certified, I guess it. So it, it's, it's really a political struggle, but it's also a legal struggle. We're in the courts right now. And those court cases that are trying to block the certification of the additional three states, all from right-wing states that they're fighting us, uh, will be determined eventually in the Supreme Court, but not until probably the fall of 21. By that time, if everything is flipped, I think it's a new ball game. We have a chance, but the election is going to be key. And I feel very strongly that all of us have got to do all we can to flip the Senate and the presidency. And finally, finally, equality will be ours. Wow. Uh, that was wonderful, Ellie. <laughs> Well, I'd want to do it as short as possible, but I feel so strongly we are so close. We got to put every inch of energy we have into making it happen, and I think we can do it. They told us that the Senate could not flip, and now they're saying 10 seats are in question with the Republican majority. I don't know if it's 10, but all we need is three. Right, right. All right. Um, I, I, we only need three, but you know we got to keep the house. That's that's the thing to remember. But the, 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 yeah, we we have we have to keep the house. We must get a majority in the Senate, and, and but it's more than just a majority. It must be a, 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 a leadership majority. That's why it won't. It doesn't. In my opinion, there is no way of getting it unless the leadership decides to not block it. McConnell will not allow a vote. There is a reality. And by the way, we say a lot about people, but we never mention the, the, their ideology or whatever. But forget that. The largest single employer in Louisville is a health insurance company that employs 46,000 people. Why do you think he kept on trying to reverse the Affordable Care Act? It's because health insurance companies, many of them, not all, but many, are opposed to the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things they're opposed to is there is a, a I call it a Title IX provision, but they can't discriminate against uh, on the basis of sex or race um, in, uh, in health insurance pricing, um, and our health insurance benefits. And the pricing benefits difference and the, how, uh, the pricing and benefits uh, differences were very, very big before the Affordable Care Act put that clause in it. I want to pray for Tina. She has really, really put together a large, large coalition, and the current ERA coalition is very, very active. Um, and, and I'm hoping everybody joins the amicus brief for the women's organizations. Did you plug that, Bettina? I don't think you did. I have not yet, but thank you so much. And I want to praise Ellie, the Mutual Admiration Society, because she's been working at this for 50 years, but also the most passionate person, I guess, other than myself and some other people that I know. She never gave up her passion. So she inspires me every day. But yes, we are, we are doing a, um, and we're looking for groups to sign on. I mean, it would be fantastic. We, we would love to have the Delta sign on. Um, and any- I, I have a small organization I'd like to sign on. If I can contact, someone can contact me offline. Allies Reaching for Equality. Okay, I tell you what, we'll connect her with your email, so Susan. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay. I, I want to mention also there is a, a lawsuit right now um, which is approaching the Supreme Court. It's still in the amicus brief stage. The National Organization for Women Virginia is a sign on to that lawsuit. And Charlotte Gibson, who is attending one of the most tireless workers in NOW, the Virginia NOW group uh, for the ERA, and her people have been extremely active in it as well. Um, and we, we did all uh, get involved with Katie's um, solidified coalition, VA ratified ERA. And now we have the National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia uh, for that, because now that we've gotten it through our legislature, we have other issues that we want to be sure to push for. So we are, we are working on it. We continue to work on it. We expect it's going to be January if, if our, uh, for our amicus briefs and the suit to be heard because it takes so long and the court's not exactly meeting. Now they are meeting, but not meeting, if you know what I mean. So um, our biggest worry, of course, is the health of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, because without her, it's very likely that we'll have appointed another Supreme Court justice that is on the more conservative side. So just everybody pray for her. <laughs> Connie, I have a question. Yes. Uh, for Allie. Allie, can you talk about um, the prohibit, pro prohibiting the archivist from signing? How, how does that work? I mean, how, how can that happen? This is what the, uh, the case is about, is that the Illinois, Virginia, and Nevada who want to be recognized uh, have, are saying in court that the archivist has no power to reject. And how they're, they're basing it on is that under the uh, amending clause of the Constitution, the president has no power and the, uh, there was no Department of Justice. Remember, these people are all originalists. Uh, these, not all of them, but some of the conservatives on the court. Well, originally, the president was purposely excluded from the amending process. And also, there was no Department of Justice, so they never, no one ever thought. But what's happening is that Trump ha um, administration has instructed the archivist who works under the Department of Justice not to certify. We question the constitutionality of that. We do not believe they have that power. Okay. And um, so that's, that's what's going to be litigated. Uh, that and also there's, a, I, I know that Patina said it, but it cannot be emphasized enough, is that the states never voted on this deadline. This was in like the whereas clause, the resolution. Uh, but the part that was the ERA had no deadline on it at all. And we believe it therefore is, was not binding. Also remember when we moved to extend the deadline, uh, we had it thoroughly legally researched and the Congressional Research Services said if the, if the Congress had the power to put a deadline on, it certainly has the power to remove it. We don't even know if they had that power because in fact they didn't put it in what the states voted on. And remember, it's the states that are ratifying. Anyway, we think we're in good position for the legal quest, but we'll be in a better position even if we could just remove it. Because if Congress had the power to put it on, they have the power to remove it. Hi. Can you, Hi. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, it we, looks like Sharon Kirch has been um, has her hand raised. Shall we? Yes. Okay. Unmute her. Okay. Go ahead. My question is about flipping the Senate. Um, is it three seats plus the White House where the VP would be the deciding vote um, or four seats total? Is that what we need to flip for the Senate? Six. Um, we, uh, to my knowledge, we only need three. Um, and, and basically, though, we could lose one of ours. Uh, so. Uh, for example, Jones in Alabama has a very strong, hard race. So to be safe, it would be better if we could win four or even five. Four would probably be necessary because the, it also it depends who's the vice president. Remember, if there's a tie vote, the vice president can, uh, can break the tie. Uh, Greenberg, 
um, I was involved with the Maryland State ERA and the federal ERA way back then. Now I've retired to Florida and it's a whole different scene down here. Uh, my two questions that I get down here most are one, is it still important for Florida to be pushing as a state? And secondly, what about the, is there any um, possibility for the movements in the states that are trying to withdraw their ratification? Well, you know, I can to ratify what you've ratified. There's no process for that. Am I correct? I mean, there's, so that, no. so, so yeah, so, so that there's no, nothing in the constitution says that you can unratify, you can only ratify, but, you know, it's, but at the same time, um, that, that is a question. And so that's why it's so important for states like Florida to continue, because we really do want to pursue a 50 state strategy. Um, first of all, because we should, every state in the, in this country should vote um, to ratify the uh, ERA, but also because say it does come in front of some conservative court and they decide, okay, no, we're going to count it. If we have more, the more states we have, the better covers all of your bases. Um, and then in addition to the unratif to the states that have tried to vote to rescind, you know, it doesn't really necessarily make sense to kind of like poke the bear. Um, <laughs> right. Point. So that's why we really haven't done a lot to um, states to draw attention to re-ratify. Besides, that would be kind of acknowledging that their rescission was valid. Um, so, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Remember another thing: uh, the Fourteenth Amendment had a rescission. So if, if in fact oh, they right. would decide to open up that ball, that thing, they would have a lot of problems. Uh, so there's there's no question that we think that the rescissions will not be counted. Uh, and basically, um, but we're encouraging all states, Florida, North Carolina, Arizona, uh, and other states to keep their movement going because uh, you just never know. <laughs> And, and besides, it could kick off energy for a state ERA. In other words, amendment to the state constitution. Suzanne Wilhite, I'm sorry, yes. Yes, I had a question. Um, I'm very involved with the ERA here in Minnesota and I work with Betty Folliard and I was in Virginia and that was awesome to be there for that energy. Uh, but one of the challenges I face is talking about ERA and people say, well, well, that's not really important. We've got all these other important things. And now with COVID, there's even more other important things. But I'm seeing greater effects to women, like you talk about with wage, with health care, child care, um, women leaving professions because of the added burdens. I, is there anything that can that's being messaged around why this is important now? Because it seems even more important now. So I'd ask any of the panelists, is, are there any messaging we can have or that you're developing that highlights even the increased importance of ERA right now? Can I suggest that you also go to the National Women's Law Center site and look up We Demand More. And you can also sometimes see it as a separate. And that has been the response of about 80 women's organizations to what's happening with COVID. And I think underlying a lot of their reasons are we need the ERA so that we're equal, but I'm sure our panelists have something to say too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, I agree with, with, with what you, what you're saying. And a lot of, I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is that COVID does not affect every population proportionally. Um, it's especially, um, you know, the divide on, on who is getting sickest and who is dying by racial and class. Um, the breakdown is just, just so disproportionate. Um, and, you know, one of the things with women is, we, um, you know, uh, women of color are especially face a, a really big pay gap um, and, and just all kinds of inequalities that the ERA could could provide. And so, I mean, I think it needs to be about the fact that we see 
how um, how inequality plays out in a real way, uh, especially to the most vulnerable populations. You know, and so so pushing for equality at this point in time is incredibly important. Uh, well, what what it shows also a lack of insurance coverage. Uh, the reality is that, that women not only pay more for less before the Affordable Care Act, and now it's been corrected, but it, it might be reversed. Remember, as we speak, the, uh, the um, Trump administration is in court to demolish the uh, Affordable Care Act. Right. In other words, if we got a bad ruling in that case, there is no Affordable Care Act, and all the discriminatory things go back in. But secondly, and, and equally as important, what it showed the, the COVID is that women don't have childcare. They don't have uh, paid family medical leave. They aren't covered as much by insurance of any kind because of, of um, ex ex expense and because not only are women underpaid, and I think we need a new slogan, slogan than an equal pay or for equal work. We need an equal income. What I mean by that is, even if we got the minimum wage increase, and we're all for increasing it to a minimum of $15, but that doesn't talk about insurance coverage. That doesn't cover talk about pension plans. It doesn't, it doesn't include benefits. When you include benefits, women aren't making 70 some cents on the dollar. We're making, we're lucky if we're making 50 cents on the dollar. The low paid jobs have no benefits. You need more power, and women need more power, and they should, for once and all, not be thought of as a side game. By the way, Social Security, we talk about all these people in the nursing homes and not being treated right. Two-thirds are on Medicaid. Most are women. And why, why is, is it such shabby care? Because, in fact, Medicaid pays very little. So the, the nursing home care is not what it should be. Uh, I could go on and on. Social Security benefits are totally discriminatory. They penalize women for taking time off for taking care of sick people or children. And it, it, is, it has a discriminatory impact. All this could be litigated and we'd have a hell of a lot more strength with an Equal Rights Amendment. But I, hi, I'm Jan Strout. I could even become visible. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Ellie, thank you. Uh, Part one, is there a strong uh, presence of indigenous women, indigenous people in the coalition? And if so, could we learn about them and build those relationships, particularly for states in the West or just Montana, speaking for my own Montana now state? Part two is given the suffrage 2020 uh, commemoration that is going on by a number of organizations and institutions around our country, are there efforts as strategies to be able to link the fact that the, the voting rights of the 19th Amendment primarily benefited white women? Lots of women are missing in action. Women of color, indigenous women are missing in action. Will the ERA and can a message be put out that this will enhance and reclaim all women's voting rights as a result of- So on the first one, the first one, I, I would say that, you know, as a coalition, we could definitely, and if you have contacts, we could definitely broaden our scope to indigenous women and would love to. Uh, one of our, uh, a woman who we work with frequently, uh, Jessica Linehan, she had a, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and she, she's a very strong, um, and she's going to be on our town hall on Thursday, which I hope everyone can come as a town hall on domestic violence on, in the ERA. And that's another important thing that we're seeing yes. is that domestic violence is increasing. Um, but she is a, is a very strong advocate for, um, the rights of indigenous people. So she'll probably be talking about that, but I do think that, um, that our coalition could definitely expand um, that constituency. So if you have contacts, please feel free to share. I'm not an expert at voting rights. So I would, I would, I, 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 I wouldn't feel comfortable commenting on the voting rights aspect. Um, Ellie, I don't know if you have. Yeah, the voting right, rights I could comment on is that, um, as we all know, there is organized suppression of the vote based on race. Some of it's based on um, age 
and like students and uh, others is uh, on sex. I think that what we uh, and of course uh, the pr suppression of vote was to suppress the vote of women of uh, people of color um, and 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 obviously Latinos are on the basis of ethnicity. Um, it basically, on the sex of the part that we we uh, forget is women still change their name, and so basically, if uh, on some of these so-called strict voting reg uh, registration requirements or IDs, um, they m might demand a birth certificate or a and a marriage certificate to show that you changed your name and you are who you said you were when you were born. In other words, it's a way to harass targeted is because of the gender gap. They know that they being, I, I don't know how to say these things without partisanship. Right now it's the Republican party that that's, has a whole industry of suppression of the vote. And they are suppressing the vote of people who they think vote against them. And one of the problems, um, one of the things very clearly is they know there's, they try to suppress all of them. Um, now, what does the Equal Rights Amendment do? It, it, it get the weakest thing that we have to fight on because we don't have that many civil rights. We are not covered uh, in the Constitution. It is harder to win a sex discrimination case than a race discrimination case. Um, not that it should, you know, thank God it's harder it, that race to sex, depending on who the judges are, uh, matters on interpretation. So I personally believe all these things argue more for an amendment, um, not less. And if you've noticed, even in this, this uh, no one's mentioned Mrs. America, which I think is a total misrepresentation. It's placing, it's somehow saying this crowd of women defeated it and, and no crowd of women defeated it. Women didn't have the power. But um, I think that what it does is it takes away from our brain who the real opponent is. And, I, I, and the real opponent is vested interests that benefit from race and sex discrimination and ethnic discrimination and therefore want to suppress the rights of those people so they don't vote because they know they're going to vote against them. I've got, uh, Connie, I have an announcement. Okay. Uh, I want to remind everybody that today is the last day that you can request an absentee ballot in Maryland and D.C. for the uh, primary. Right. Thank okay. you so much, Jeanette. I meant to do that, but I didn't have my election chief half on at the time. Um, so we are having a... Uh, uh, primary in Virginia as well, which they have moved from the first Tuesday to this is the fourth Tuesday of June in the hope that this COVID thing will die down and more people will come out. But we're also telling people in Virginia to get uh, uh, um, ballots because now we have no excuse absentee balloting, thank goodness. It doesn't really come into effect till July, but you just have to put down illness because nobody wants COVID and you're in like Flynn. So uh, go ahead and do that and I'll Next time I see, I'll tell you all about the election. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, thank you so much. Did you get thank that you. in the chat box, Lisa? Yes, there you go. Lisa Sales, put it in the chat box. You can copy it right out of there and then go and sign up for it. I think I have, and I hope I hope Pat Roos has. I'm going to send it to you. It'll be a great discussion. We hope you can all come. And if you have, and also in the chat form, there's a, space to ask a question. We have, I think, 250 people signed up, so not everyone can ask their question, but we'll get their question asked. But if you put it in there, um, then, it's, then it's a possibility. Thank okay, thank you, everyone. Take care. Please stay safe. Stay away from people if you have to, but stay safe and stay well. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.